It was May 1945, and the war in the European theater had just ended. Yet, over the borderland of the Netherlands and Germany, a lonesome Focke-Wulf FW-190 bearing the swastika insignia roared through the sky. At the controls sat American pilot Bob Hoover, executing an audacious escape from captivity. His hands, steady despite the turmoil, gripped the controls of the enemy aircraft with instructions all in German. With no parachute and deep within Allied territory, Hoover faced a storm of doubt and determination. He thought to himself, quote, You're the dumbest aviator that ever flew. What the hell are you accomplishing? The relief of leaving his captors behind now turned into the fear of what lay ahead. He was flying the wrong colors. The image of anti-aircraft batteries flashed through his mind while looking for a suitable stretch among the friendly sight of windmills. As he prepared for an emergency landing in a field, the uncertainty of his reception on the ground loomed large. For a long time, Hoover kept this breathtaking escape to himself, believing it to be more foolhardy than heroic. Yet, as word of his daring adventure spread, his reputation soared. In the late 1930s, as Europe was on the brink of war, the only thing on American teenager Robert Hoover's mind was that after endless shifts at the grocery store, he'd finally earned enough money to buy flight training lessons. However, upon leaving the ground, Bob felt horrified to learn that being airborne made him ill. But flying had been his dream ever since he could remember, and determined to do it, he learned the aerobatics in altitudes and maneuvers he could tolerate. Before he knew it, he'd overcome nausea and air sickness and enlisted in the Tennessee National Guard. In September 1939, Hoover, a natural-born teacher and leader, was sent to England as a flight instructor in the Royal Air Force. Later, as a test and ferry pilot with the 12th Air Force in Casablanca from December 1942 to August 1943, Hoover tested newly assembled and repaired aircraft and ferried them to the front. While he valued his work as an operations officer, his ultimate goal was to dogfight with the Germans. Time and time again, the persistent pilot attempted to persuade his commanders to grant him combat duty, telling his superiors, quote, I can hit a target upside down or right side up. Beginning in the summer of 1943, Hoover, now a lieutenant, became a pilot with the 52nd Fighter Group based on the island of Corsica. Throughout 58 successful missions, Bob Hoover flew his Spitfire all over the Mediterranean and European theaters. However, on his 59th mission in February 1944, the Luftwaffe shot him and his fighter down while flying over the south coast of France. But his story had just begun. Captured upon landing, Hoover ended up confined within the grim walls of Stralag Luft in Bart, Germany, a POW camp specifically for Allied aviators. For more than 16 months, Bob Hoover was held at the camp, all while World War II's tide tilted more and more towards the Allies. During his time as a prisoner of war, he attempted to escape 15 times, all with no luck. One night, when a riot at the camp involved thousands of prisoners, Hoover and two of his friends took this opportunity and escaped. The group spent the night well hidden in a farm, being cared for by a woman who gave them food and a gun. After stealing some bicycles and driving them across the terrain, the men stumbled upon a German airfield, now abandoned, as unbeknownst to them, the beleaguered Nazis had begun deserting their posts. There, amid several damaged planes, Hoover locked his eyes onto a focke Wolf FW-190, damaged but flyable and with full fuel tanks. This fighter was his ticket to freedom. After giving his companions the gun they'd been given, Hoover bid them farewell and jumped into the cockpit of the unfamiliar fighter. With no parachute and in poor condition, knowing he had no time to waste, instead of the usual taxi down the runway, Hoover taxied across the field and took off as fast as he could, venturing into the uncertain skies alone. Once airborne, he realized his unfortunate position. He, an American, was flying a plane with Luftwaffe insignia. With no way of indicating that he was an Allied pilot, anti-aircraft artillery or a plane could take him down. Knowing he could not run the risk of trying to reach England, Hoover decided to head towards an area occupied by the Allies, guessing his flight path as he flew along the unknown territory. Suddenly, he spotted a saving grace. Windmills, characteristic of the Netherlands. By then, Knowing his fuel was almost gone, Bob Hoover needed to land quickly to keep control of the plane. As he was about to land, he saw a ditch before him. But Hoover knew he didn't want to crash into it and risk becoming trapped inside it with the enemy aircraft, where rescuers might not realize he was an American pilot before it was too late. In a split-second decision, Hoover retracted the landing gear and skidded to a halt on the field. But before he had time to wonder what to do next, he spotted a group of angry villagers, local to the Dutch town of Swader Zee, approaching his Luftwaffe aircraft. Armed with pitchforks, ready to hurt what they believed was a German, 
These farmers, who clearly did not understand English, came at Hoover from every direction. But before they could do anything, a British army truck intervened, and Bob yelled, quote, I hope you can help me. I'm a Yank. They think I'm a Kraut. The soldiers whisked Hoover to safety, where they told him about the war's end. After World War II, Bob Hoover remained in the service and became a frontline military test pilot. As jet propulsion technology replaced propeller models, Hoover took upon the dangerous task of fine-tuning some of the most groundbreaking models of the early jet era, like the Republic F-84 Thunderjet and the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. In this period, Hoover crossed paths with another test pilot, Chuck Yeager. Their friendship sparked following an impromptu mock dogfight, which concluded without a clear winner. Not long after, the two were showcasing their skills at air shows nationwide. In the mid-1940s, both were hand-chosen by the newly formed United States Air Force executives to train together at Murak Field in California to fly the Bell X-1, a rocket plane in development that was set to break the sound barrier. While both were in the running to perform the iconic feat, earlier in 1947, Hoover ruined his chances by buzzing a civilian airport in Ohio. Flying an experimental military jet at an impressively low altitude as a favor to a friend who wanted his nearby relatives to think he was the one flying the aircraft, Hoover swept over the airport with such precision and control that it left onlookers stunned and awed. When his commanders discovered he was behind the episode, Bob Hoover was named backup pilot of the X-1 project, while Jaeger went on to make history. On October 14, 1947, Hoover flew the chase plane during the test flights, making observations and taking photographs of Jaeger's Bell X-1, as he became the first man to fly beyond the speed of sound, Mach 1, over the Mojave Desert. In 1948, Bob Hoover left the Air Force, the successor to the Army Air Forces, and began a distinguished career as a civilian test pilot with many companies. For years, Hoover was behind the testing of some of the greatest and most experimental aircraft, responsible for the maiden flight of the carrier-capable XFJ-2 Fury, later becoming a civilian graduate of the U.S. Navy Test Pilot School to continue carrier flight tests of the FJ-2. Hoover also tested the F-86 Sabre and later demonstrated this jet's technology to Air Force pilots in Korea, where he flew several bombing missions to test the validity of the technology's procedures. His ample flight test and engineering knowledge led to the redesign of the tail of the first century series supersonic fighter, the iconic F-100 Super Sabre. But what truly pushed Bob Hoover to fame was his airshow flying career. Beginning in the 1960s, Hoover flew hundreds of airshows. One of his two favorite aircraft was a P-51 Mustang painted bright yellow, dubbed Old Yeller. The other was the Shrike Commander, a twin-engine civilian model that he flew as a demonstrator for North American Rockwell. On most of these shows, instead of a flight suit, Hoover wore a business suit and donned a Panama straw hat. He also created his own catchphrase, quote, Gentlemen, you have a race. Hoover's trademark maneuver on the show circuit was a death-defying plunge that made him world famous. Aboard the Shrike, the pilot would shut down one of the engines and fly in that risky configuration, dangerous for everyone but Bob. Then he would shut down the one working engine and perform a series of maneuvers powered solely by the aircraft's momentum. At the very last second, he would pull up and into a loop, culminating in a sulky smooth landing with both engines shut down. During one show, he was filmed pouring iced tea while doing a barrel roll. But his stunts were anything but reckless. Every maneuver involved meticulous planning and a careful assessment of risks. In his own words, quote, a great many former friends of mine are no longer with us, simply because they cut their margins too close. His skill as an aerobatic performer is unmatched, and Hoover set altitude and speed records in North American and Rockwell aircraft, transcontinental speed records, and time-to-climb records. As an aerobatic performer, Hoover was often sent abroad to demonstrate aircraft. On one occasion, he crossed paths with Yuri Gagarin, a Soviet pilot who was the first person to fly to outer space. According to his autobiography, they became friends despite not speaking the same language. They even went water skiing together for a French television show. This friendship would save his life when the threat of imprisonment knocked on his door once again. In 1966, as captain of the United States team at an international aerobatics competition in Russia, Hoover wiped out every other participant with his antics, even flying an unauthorized display of loops and upside-down flight, enraging the Soviets, who wanted to arrest him for the show. But Gagarin, who was at the event, wouldn't allow it. Unsteady from one too many drinks, according to Hoover, quote, he left the stage and came racing towards me. Before long, I was on stage, standing beside the first man to orbit the Earth. It was a scene unlike any other I've ever experienced. 
Hoover continued to demonstrate many other jet models, like the T-39 and the Sabre Liner, and even earned his helicopter rating in the 1970s. Bob Hoover continued to fly tour circuits at air shows in the United States and abroad until 1994, when the Federal Aviation Administration intervened. According to the organization's medical examiners, the now 72-year-old was deemed unfit to fly due to diminished cognitive abilities. Knowing he wasn't done flying just yet, he recertified himself in Australia and began a legal battle back in America. For 18 months, Hoover and his attorney led a campaign that found support among fans who wrote thousands of letters. On one occasion, during the Oshkosh Fly-In and Air Show held in Wisconsin, posters with the phrase, Let Bob Fly, were shared by admirers. Bob Hoover's U.S. license was restored after an examination, and he emerged victorious from his legal battle. Finally, in 1999, at the age of 77, he retired from performing aerobatics at air shows, but remained an influential and revered figure in the aviation community, sharing his knowledge. Often referred to as the pilot's pilot, his safety advice to young pilots was essential. Pilot Bob Hoover's last flight was aboard his famous Shrike Commander in October 2003, when he flew the aircraft to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., where it remains on display today. By the time his flying career ended after 65 years, he was one of the most honored pilots in American history, with awards such as the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Soldier's Medal of Valor, the Air Medal with Clusters, the Purple Heart, and the French Croix de Guerre. Most importantly, he was admired by his fellow pilots. From his childhood idol Orville Wright, Charles Lindbergh, World War I ace Eddie Rickenbacker, astronaut Neil Armstrong, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, and more, everyone who met him also came to love him. World War II hero and aviation pioneer Jimmy Doolittle called Bob, quote, the greatest stick and rudder man that ever lived, while his close friend Chuck Yeager described him in the foreword of Hoover's biography as, quote, the greatest pilot I ever saw. In October 2016, the National Aviation Hall of Fame confirmed that aviation legend Bob Hoover, a pilot who escaped captivity in the stolen Luftwaffe plane, tested supersonic aircraft with his pal Chuck Yeager, and captivated the world as a breathtaking stunt performer, had passed away at the age of 94 years old. <laughs>